Thank you very much. Thank you very much also for the invitation. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure be, to be here and to see you again. So in the meantime, I've moved from uh, Graz University of Technology to No Center, which is actually a small research lab close to Graz University of Technology. And this is joint work with my colleague Ali. Uh, you will notice him, he's sitting here in the audience. And since unfortunately I have to leave very soon after my talk, I apologize for that. And I'm also sorry for missing the interesting talks today and tomorrow. Uh, my colleague Ali will be definitely uh, capable of answering all your questions offline if you have them in the evening or tomorrow. Probably even better than I can do it. So what this talk is about, it's about, uh, it is more in the machine learning domain than information theory domain, but there has been recently the idea to use the information bottleneck principle to train and analyze neural networks. And we did take a closer look at that, whether that's actually a good idea or not. So. Uh, representation learning is a field where you usually try to compress features to to some uh, to some yeah to some uh, lower dimensional representation that still contains full information about the entire image. What we're looking here at is neural networks for the purpose of uh, classification. So we have uh, say an n-dimensional input uh, feature that could be images, and we have uh, finite uh, set of classes. This could be cat, dog, mouse, and so on. And then we have a plain feed-forward network where we assume that one entire layer of this feed-forward network is an internal representation. And we're, when we talk about representation learning in this context, we're not talking about representing the input with a lower dimensional representation, but capturing uh, the class information in this lower uh, dimensional or even higher dimensional representation. So we only want to keep the information about the class and not about the input feature. So that's the thing that we will uh, we'll be looking at here. So in a more, uh, I, I would like to point to this case here. So we assume in this particular case that the last layer of the neural network still has continuous output values. So we have maybe continuous input values, and then we have weights, and then we have uh, nonlinear activation functions. And here, we do not restrict the output values that we have here at this layer. Only when we go from this layer to the final uh, decision, which class do we have, here we make uh, an argmax rule or a softmax rule. Here we convert these real valued numbers to a probability distribution over the classes. So Getting one level of abstract, uh, abstraction higher, we, we look at this block diagram. We have a finite class set. We have uh, maybe real valued, maybe discrete valued features. We don't know. We have an encoder that consists of all weights and activations up to some latent representation that we consider. So this L could be one of these L, L1 to L4. Uh, and we have an encoder leading up to this. Uh, latent representation, and then we have a decoder that takes this latent representation, goes to the second last layer, and then in the second last layer, we apply the decision rule to get an estimate of the class. So this one here is argmax, softmax, and this one is written here in blue. This is still part of this neural network with uh, nonlinear activation functions and with weights. Uh, we simplify the analysis for ourselves by assuming that we know the joint distribution between features and class because this way we don't have to take care about sample complexity bounds and we don't have to take care about finite sampling effects. But we can assume that with this we are in a best case scenario uh, but what can be done when you train a neural network with the information bottleneck functional. And we make one more assumption, namely that encoder and decoder are deterministic functions so we really have simply a multiplication with a weight matrix and then we add a bias term and then to this result we apply element-wise or coordinate-wise this nonlinear activation function and the set of parameters of the encoder is just the set of mate matrices and bias uh, vectors that lead up to that. And the set uh, param of parameters psi of the decoder is just the remaining set of parameters of the neural network. So this is the setting that we're looking at. And our goal is to find a nice latent representation. So what does nice latent representation mean in the context of classification? So obviously we want that this latent representation contains all the information that is relevant for classification. So L should, be, uh, should contain sufficient information for, uh, to, to determine Y, at least as much information as it was ori originally in, in X. So we know by the data processing inequality that we cannot increase the information that was there in original features, but we should try to make sure that we do not throw away this relevant information. 
at the same time, we would like that this latent representation gets rid of all information that is not necessary for classification. And that's the thing that distinguishes uh, this uh, part of representation learning from representation learning in an autoencoding setup, for example. So here we really want to have a sufficient statistic for the class and a minimal sufficient statistic in that sense. Other than that, we also want that this latent representation is such that we can extract this information about the class easily. So there is no point in having a very complicated random variable with which we can't work. We also need to extract information out of this random variable. And therefore, we want that this latent representation is simple in some well-defined sense. Simple is always uh, to be interpreted in connection with the decoder structure. So if we have a deep decoder structure, the latent representation can be more complex than if we are already at the last or second to last layer. Then this latent uh, in, uh, representation should be such that it is very easily uh, to, uh, to extract the class information out of it. And finally, we would like that this latent representation is robust to small noise, small deformations of the input features. So if we add a little bit of noise, if we, uh, if we do some small rotations, then we would like that this latent representation doesn't change much with it. Because we want that adding small noise and small, uh, small deformations doesn't change the class. So that's why uh, we want to have this robustness also, and we believe that this kind of robustness is somehow related to generalization also although it is extremely hard to disentangle all these, uh, these uh, factors. So from an information theoretic perspective, especially the first two properties appear to be, uh, yeah, to be very amenable to being quantified with information theoretic quantities. And specifically, uh, it has been done in the past also that people say, well, a sufficient uh, statistic, a sufficient rep uh, representation that allows for classification has a large mutual information with the class variable and a compressed or uh, one that has removed all the redundant information has a small mutual information with the input features. And these two properties taken together uh, are often encoded in the information bottleneck functional. And I think it was at an uh, ITW where Tishby and his colleague argued that the information bottleneck functional can be used not only for analyzing deep neural networks, but also for training neural networks. And since then, there has, been a, uh, there has been a hype around that in the machine learning community. People have looked at this uh, from multiple perspectives. They have criticized TSP, they have supported TSP. So the, the, it's, it's not exactly clear what the situation is at the moment. Uh, but th there have been quite successful um, uh, attempts to start with this information bottleneck functional, do a few small approximations to it, and then end up with really nice um, latent representations. So this is a work by the Santa Fe Institute where they trained a latent representation of the MNIST data set. And you can see that you have very nicely separated clusters for each digit in the MNIST data set. And then there is a group, uh, this was uh, this group um, from Google, I think. And they also showed, yeah, what you get is you get separated clusters where the digits of the MNIST data set, they are one cluster and this is, these clusters are separated from each other. So in summary, by starting from that, you got simple latent representations. You also got improved generalization performance and adversarial robustness was also claimed to be obtained by uh, minimizing this information bottleneck functional. So the question for us was, if we encode uh, the fact that we want to have a sufficient and a minimum sufficient statistic with information theoretic cost functions, do we automatically get a simple latent representation and robustness? And in, in our opinion, this is not the case. So we looked at this and we dissected this and we said, okay, this functional suffers from several issues. First of all, it is not clear if you can compute it. In which cases is this even finite? Second, if it is finite, can you optimize it with standard gradient descent based techniques? This may not matter in a general case, but in deep learning, it does matter that you can optimize it using gradient descent. We now attack somehow this information bottleneck principle for training neural networks on three different perspectives. First of all, we will argue that in many cases, the information bottleneck functional is infinite, so you can't actually use it for optimization. In cases, even when it is finite, you can't optimize it by gradient-based uh, methods, which matters in, um, in deep learning. And finally, because it is invariant on the bijection, so there is no reason why it should actually lead to simple representations or to representations that are robust against noise. 
And that is not very surprising, this simplicity, this P3, is not very surprising because as you see up here, this only depends on the parameters of the encoder. So there's no reason to believe why a decoder that is not even present in this functional light on any of the random variables nor in the parameters should be considered at all when you, when you optimize that. So uh, there's actually no surprise when you don't get simple representations. And finally, uh, that's a side note, this information bottleneck functional uh, is a regularizer for the representation and not for, uh, for the network parameters as you would use in weight decay or something. So you cannot expect to get sparse weight matrices that are somehow useful in some cases. So let's go through these three things in detail. Um, and we showed uh, a small theorem where we say, in, under the assumption that the input features have a continuous distribution, okay? And we have this additional constraint that the continuous distribution has a PDF and has a continuous PDF. But this is, I, I, I'm pretty sure that this can be loosened and I'm pretty sure that you can relax that even uh, a bit further. And we do so in the paper a little bit. Uh, but let's say we have a continuous input and let's say that the Activation functions are either by Lipschitz or they are continuously differentiable with strictly positive derivatives. So that means something like they are invertible. So this, that's, that means this holds for tangent hyperbolicals, this holds for sigmoid activation functions, this holds for leaky ReLU, but it doesn't hold for ReLU or step activation functions. So for these it doesn't hold. But if, if these two conditions are given, then for almost every choice of the weight matrices of the encoder and all uh, biased uh, vectors of the encoder, the, this compression term that accounts for P2 uh, for removing ground information is plus infinity. So this was, uh, this has been observed before. So people have uh, found out that, or have argued that if you have a deterministic mapping, then so L is a function of X, and if L is continuous, then obviously this term is plus infinity. But uh, I ju would just like to point out that this holds even if L is not continuous. So there are cases where L is not continuous, but L has a singular distribution on some maybe higher dimensional space, and then still you would get this property. So you don't have, uh, you don't need the restriction that this latent representation has an absolutely continuous distribution on its uh, on its dimension. So that's maybe uh, what has been, but what, what previously has to be a bit more simplified. But in principle, uh, this is one of the problems that people have observed before already. And wh why is this a problem? Well, if the entire functional, this one, is plus infinity for all choices of the weight matrix, then is, there is not much to, approx the, to, to, to optimize. Because uh, it's, it's equally bad. You, you, how would you minimize something that is infinite for all choices of the weight matrices? So that's one of the problems where people have argued that using the information bottleneck functional as it is is maybe not a good idea. Uh, okay, let's ignore that for a moment and let's say, okay, well, we have images that are grayscale, let's quantize them to 256 uh, uh, bins. So if we have a discrete distribution at the input and then the information bottleneck functional is obviously a finite quantity. But the thing is, the functional itself then becomes a piecewise constant function of the parameters. And therefore you cannot use gradient-based optimization techniques. And I would like to give you a short example why this is the case. So this is a one-dimensional feature, two classes, class red, class black, four mass points, size of the dots indicates the probability mass of these mass points. Then we take a simple, I think you need two layers, a real activation function, and let's say we have the parameter B fixed and the parameter A is a parameter that we vary. And then when we look at this compression term that was infinite previously for almost all choices of uh, theta, uh, we look at this term as a function of A, we see, well, okay, this becomes piecewise constant. And why is that? Well, there are only three areas where these points can lie. They can all lie here, they can all lie here, or maybe some are on this slope. So there are only finitely many choices how mass points are grouped or how mass points are mapped together. And that's why of this continuous parameter A, this information bottleneck function is uh, piecewise continuous and therefore you can't optimize it really using gradient-based techniques. That's actually interesting because the information bottleneck function was designed exactly for this setting where you have a discrete features and uh, a discrete target, but that's a different issue here because here we want to estimate the real value parameter of this, uh, of, of a specific implementation of the conditional distribution that the information bottleneck function optimizes differently. So in this case, gradient-based techniques cannot be used at least uh, to determine the weights of the neural network. And even if we ignore these two things, so these two things are, well, this is a computational issue, there may be other ways to do that, for example, Bayesian methods, but uh, let's come back to this 
question of simple representations or robust representations. And then this invariance under bijections kicks in and shows that there is no way that we can achieve that. So let's say we have this uh, input features. These are the supports. We have, again, two classes, class red, class black. Uh, actually, it only uh, suffices to look at one of these dimensions, of these two-dimensional features. And we, again, use a neural network with relu activation functions. Probably also here, two layers are sufficient. And we see that these two latent representations are equivalent in an information theoretic sense. So they both uh, do not mix classes. They both give you full information about the classes. So you preserve the entire information of the classes. And well, you even preserve the identity of the, of the individual uh, manifolds, if you want. But uh, the information bottleneck functional says that both of them are equivalent because they evaluate the same number in both cases. However, here, it would suffice to just cut apart here. So this one, this latent representation, can be uh, decoded in a more simple manner than this one where you need a more complicated decoder, if you want. So the simplicity of representation is uh, obviously not encoded in this, uh, in this structure here. And neither is robustness, because in this very simple example, uh, the latent representations are, they are the same, actually. But if you would uh, imagine adding a little bit of noise here or a little bit of noise here, then you will see that this uh, decoder, uh, this encoder would actually be preferable because it has a small margin here which keeps the classes still, which keeps the class assignment still uh, correct. Whereas here, where the threshold where the, uh, is, is very close to the boundary of this region, a little bit of noise would immediately give you a wrong uh, classification result here. So the information bottleneck functional is not capable of uh, deciding between these two representations, even though one of them is, uh, or, well, this one here is preferable in terms of robustness against noise and more deformations. So summarizing, <coughs> the functional is infinite for a continuous input. It is piecewise constant in general. Uh, these are computational problems, but it also does not encourage simple representations, nor does it encourage robust representations. So the question is, why does it work? People have shown previously that it works, and that they get actually quite nice representations with dense uh, clusters that are separate and far apart. So how does that actually work? And we looked into this, and we found three main ingredients that could get you there. And I, I will list them, and then I, we will see what, what people have done previously. So. Uh, one thing to do is to look at the information bottleneck functional, not with respect to a latent representation, but with respect to this output here. And this output already includes the decoder. So this output here already includes, say we want to uh, find the best encoder for latent representation L2, but to measure the mutual information here means that we need to include already the decoder part and the decision rule. And that means that we get uh, finite quantities in all cases, and we automatically get that these uh, latent representations are simple. So because the information can be extracted easily. On the other hand, it is not exactly clear what the compression term is used for in this case. The second thing is we had this picture before where uh, this was preferable over that, but the information bottleneck functional couldn't choose. So why not just add a little bit of noise here already during training? If we add a little bit of noise during training, make these boundaries bigger, then this functional will be preferred by the information bottleneck -like functional. So the idea is, rather than training a deterministic neural network, let's train a stochastic neural network where we add noise somewhere. And um, Ziv Goldfeld and Yuri Boliansky and his co-authors have showed that in some cases this even leads to geometric compression. So it, this actually means to, uh, leads to some kind of clustering. And the third rule is uh, actually the most honest one, I think, you take this information bottleneck functional and you replace the individual terms by something that is more well behaved. For example, you take this mutual information and you replace it by the cross entropy uh, where L is replaced by Y hat, for example, the cross entropy of the output given this latent representation. So this is one goal that is very, a, a very good idea because this at the same time <coughs> makes sure that you are informative about the class and that you can extract information in a simple manner. And secondly, people have tried replacing this term which uh, would be infinite, which is finite in the uh, stochastic case by variational bounds that in some case also encourage geometric compression. So using variational bounds may be a good idea here. Um, so uh, given all the problems that we have seen before, 
the implemented approximations yield simple like representations, improved generalization, and improved adversarial robustness, but it's the approximations that make the information bottleneck principle work rather than the information bottleneck principle on its own. And that already brings me to the conclusion. So, uh, yeah, I don't think I need to summarize that again. I just want to say that using the bottleneck prin principle uh, in itself for training deterministic DNNs is not a good idea, but you can use it to train stochastic DNNs. You can uh, use it by including the decision rule and you can uh, uh, enforce geometric compression rather than information theoretic compression to get these simple representations by exchanging parts of the cost function with more well-behaved terms. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think that's it for now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.